Thank you, Emily, for that introduction. And also, uh, in recognizing the Algonquin uh, lands that we are, we are standing on here. And I guess that's what it's all about at the end of the day. And Joe spoke of uh, uh, the piece about community engagement and organizations. So, so I'm going to focus on community engagement and organizations. And that's why I call it building authentic relationships with CSR. Um, so it's, I also approach this through the, the window of um, leadership, human behavior, and where does that all begin in terms of human values? And then we need to, I think now, it's, it's timely to focus on the issue of values and where do these values come from? All of us in this room form that word, the elites of, of this world. We, we form that. And we have a certain set of values that we have been uh, driven into us through our indoctrination, through a certain uh, a certain set of ideologies that has been taught to us through our education system, a system that has honed us and 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 prepared us to serve the industrial complex. So I started a solar energy business back in the 1980s in in Sri Lanka, uh, and I've installed thousands of systems in the rural areas, and that's the first time I encountered a rural community. I grew up in a city too, and I, and I realized that it was a completely different culture culture based on, on appreciating the land and building a resilience to the weather, the vagaries of weather that, that um, attacks or that def defines how they, how they earn. The only outside contact they have has been through an agricultural extension officer or a, or a middleman who comes in a truck to buy their crops. So when I was installing solar home systems, and I've been involved in it by, in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh, in India, in Kenya, it's been uniform. We've taken away their kerosene lamp and replaced it with the electric lamp. But the first thing they went out and did was to buy a 12-volt TV. So they leapfrogged from the darkness to a window into the world out there. And for better or for worse, the world of a con the consumerist world. 25 years later, when I go back to these villages, I find it completely a different culture now. And therein lies our challenge. And last week, I was at a conference which celebrated uh, the Canadian Association for African Studies, which celebrated Africa communicating, digital technologies, representation, and power. So we have now um, empowered these communities with, with technology. However, for those of us who have spent time, I've spent the last 25, 30 years in the developing world, I have seen that the, the chasm uh, has got wider even. Because they have now, the, these communities have got the technologies, got a taste, they've been teased with what's out there. But they haven't been able to grab onto that prosperity. So we are resented. There's a huge resentment. So whenever I go to the village, I'm resented for what I have because these communities still haven't had, it, had an opportunity to get out there and, and, and get a piece of that action yet. So therein lies, lies our biggest challenge. So, so if we, if we want to really do something about it, I think that's where the mining industry has the greatest opportunity. Uh, it's serendipitous that the mining industry has to deal with local communities. Such a huge uh, difference in cultures. Uh, and, and this is where the word authentic comes from. Uh, and I hear this word authentic being used suddenly by organizations, mining companies, uh, on reports, by governments. So what does it really mean? So I, I, my inquiry has been to figure out what this means. And I actually found this, this uh, quote by Jean-Paul Sartre, who I thought captures it quite well. You know, it's, it's, it's getting the true and lucid consciousness of this actual situation that's out there but assume the, assuming the responsibilities and, and the risks that are attached to what's really happening out there, accepting it in pride or humiliation. humiliation. And it also says that it requires a lot of courage, and that is very rare. So the pathology that, that we have been trained in this single, to create this single objective, uh, rational, logical, uh, uh, reality that we are we are living in is driven by fear because we are trying to deal with the business world is trying to deal with uh, uh, scarce resources and we are trying to 
uh, create efficiencies out of it. So we are trained, highly trained in our university systems to, to meet that need in particular. We are not adept at, at dealing with these other issues that are to deal with communities, that are to deal with the externalities that are creating these problems. And I think therein lies the other challenge that we're facing. So how do we meet that challenge? How do we, we we're going like this. How are we gonna bridge that gap? And, and I, I believe, and I just had a conversation with some uh, with the person out there who said he was at a, con as a workshop uh, yesterday uh, organized by CAM and the mining industry leaders. And he said, you know, we all had uh, congruence in the kind of values that we were promoting. There were CEOs of companies, mining companies, there were government people, there were, there were NGOs who, there, who were there said we had the same set of values. And that's the other issue. We have, a, as human beings, we have a moral compass and we know what those values are. But our institutions, because of the institutional demands that are out there for efficiency and for profit, then creates a clash between our values and what the institution demands us to do. So our values are compromised. So how do we now, now bring about, bring our attention towards those values? And, and what are the industry, a rich industry with so much of money that's available, uh, working with governments, and how do we now get this industry to, to think about compromising a little bit in the greater, for the greater good? And I think that's our other challenge. So if you look at the industry itself, what, what gives it its license, the legal license to operate, the 15th century limited liability laws that were brought about by the Crown so they can undertake large, large uh, ventures like buying a ship, 100,000 pounds, find 10 investors and limit their liability to that investment. So if the ship goes under, you're only liable for that 10,000 pounds. So the limited liability laws had a purpose. So our railroads and our big infrastructure projects were built by this, this, this mechanism. However, in the late 1800s, the limited liability laws uh, got, a, got some special features. A company was deemed a person and an individual in US courts in the late 1800s. Uh, enabling the company legally to lobby for governments as an individual, as well uh, 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 make campaign contributions. So here in lies the government business nexus. It was legally sanctioned. And then in 1919, in a, in a court ruling in Michigan, it was decreed that the sole purpose for a business is to make profits for its stockholders. So that's what the the, the company is supposed to do with its legal license. Everything else that happens on the other side to take it to the social license side then requires a leadership will, a leadership commitment to, to, to move the organization to the other side. Now, we think CSR is something that is, that is uh, a, a novel thing, but it isn't. If you look back in history, the Quaker companies of Cadbury and uh, uh, Rowan Tree were wonderful companies who looked after their people, who built communities around them. Uh, then there were other organizations like Tata, who, uh, Jamshedji Tata, who, who followed Gandhi's trusteeship principle, did the same thing at that time. So, so there, were, there are these examples. So it's not something new. But unfortunately, CSR has, has, has got a bad rep because over the last 10 years, many companies jumped on the bandwagon and did uh, philanthropic projects out there. and and flashed it around. And, they, and, and the reason the CSR was done was to minimize risk at the end of the day. So it was still profit oriented. So how do I minimize risk by investing, compromising some of my money in, in going out there? So, but there are exceptions, there have been exemptions and, and there are many exemptions, exceptions out there even in the mining industry, even within the mining industry. However, we, we still have a long way to go so if you're looking at organizational culture, so that, that is the, the engagement that Joe was talking about. The, the organization is still structured in a hierarchical way. <clears throat> and that's, that's where the control comes from. And, and it's driven through motivation, it's driven through fear because of the challenges of survival. But on the other side, the mining industry now has to deal with the community whether it's indigenous or a rural community who has a different set of values based on the circle, based on the land. Their, 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 their spiritual values are brought into this. 
So, so you have now a clash of cultures who are coming in, and that community is now being empowered. And we see that in the northern, northern, in northern Canada, what's happening in, in the north. And if any of you have seen the, the recent documentaries on the James Bay Cree of how Billy Diamond uh, took on the Borassa government, and what did they do? So they have, uh, uh, in, in the first movie, it, 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 it depicts very clearly where uh, there's, there's a, he speaks, or Billy Diamond speaks of a meeting uh, his father had with, uh, uh, with uh, Premier Barassa. And while he was seated there talking to Premier Barassa, Premier Barassa got up after 10 minutes and left the meeting saying he had another meeting to go to. So he was left sitting there staring at an empty chair. He called Billy Diamond over 10 minutes later and he said, Billy, in his Cree language, he just told him, you learnt the trade, you learnt the language from the white man in those schools. Now use what you learned and fight for our land. And that's exactly what the James Bay Cree did. They learned the techniques, technologies, uh, uh, ways, and they were extremely strategic, which took the Borassa government by surprise. But they also still had the other side, the honor for the land, um, uh, it, the, the interconnectedness, the ritual, uh, all those things. And that was a powerful combination that the, the hierarchical world could not meet. So, so organizations now, the business organizations now, now have, a, have, a, have an incredible, incredible opportunity to meet, to, to become holistic in, in, in thinking. And that's what requires a leadership, uh, le leadership uh, transformation. So, so what are the challenges that the mining industry has? And Doug, you make a dis uh, good distinction between uh, the, the exploration companies and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the large companies out there who are actually doing the mining. And I, I must say, a lot of the mining companies are, are behaving in the right way now and doing a lot of good things. But it's the exploration company that's a, that sets the stage for the future relationship with the mining companies. So they, at that level, need a lot of help. So if is FPIC even a reality? Is it even a possibility in this, in this context? Because an exploration company may go in, may not find uh, a deposit there, and are they creating expectations at the rural level? So it's a very complex situation on the ground, uh, but there is a clash of cultures for sure that we still need to address. So authentic relationships then require communications, require respect, re require empathy, require partnerships, trust, and how do we now grow together? So these are some of the things that companies are looking at in terms of leadership values and culture. And all these things then create and help the company to still stay sustainable. I'm not taking away the, the need for companies to, to, to earn a profit and, and to move on and, 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 and contribute to the economy. But where do we, we compromise? So in terms of risk, a company that is not even compliant is at the highest, is facing the highest amount of risk. And then, as you move down this ladder, you lower your risk. And purpose and passion at the end of the day is, and, and there have been, there are organizations, and it already created Body Shop. Purpose and passion for the company was, was yes, through the value creation, we are going to also serve society. Uh, companies like Interface, Ray, uh, it was a carpet company that was one of the most polluting companies on earth, uh, Ray Anderson. Uh, actually turned that company around 75,000 employees, a um, um, multi-million dollar company, to make it an environment-friendly company. He died a few, uh, about a year ago. Uh, he was one of the few CEOs that I know who ended his TED talk with a poem, a poem about love and the community. Uh, and, and there are others like Paul Pullman, a CEO of Unilever, who's now out there talking about the need for, for engaging with the communities, need for uh, sustainability. So there, there is now a, a movement towards that, and we need to support that process. Mark Moody Stewart of Shell, who actually set up a, a solar energy business uh, while he was chairman, and when I, when I researched into who, who he was to see that he had already a, that, that kind of a bent. He ended up chairing the, 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 uh, the Johannesburg meeting of sustainability. He ended up also uh, chairing uh, Anglo-American in, in South Africa and, and spearheading some of its uh, uh, wonderful 
uh, CSR strategies that they have, and that's, that's really a benchmark that they, they created. So it was Mark Modi Seward. So it was also driven by personalities, personalities, people who had great values. So just to, just to go back, now this is what it's all about at the end of the day, that the paradigm shift that we're talking about is, is this. It's about values, it's about walking the talk. And somebody earlier on spoke about the same thing too. Because if we don't walk the talk, people are out there watching us and they see our, 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 our double talk and our credibility is lost. And that's one of the most important things of leadership. Now this is part of leadership research that's going on uh, in Stanford University at MIT in business schools now looking at leadership behaviors and the importance of congruence between our words and action. Now in terms of, now I was at a Bring you to Africa. I was at a conference uh, organized by ISID McGill uh, f uh, about eight months ago, and Lau Masha uh, said these very pertinent things from 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 his experiences in Tanzania. He said losing using police and army is not any more sustainable. Neither is building walls. So how do we engage with the community? So he had some good advice for for companies. And what about Canada? Just to finish off, what's, what, what about a vision for Canada? Um, I, Canada, well, it has got a tremendous amount of a wealth of knowledge right now in our diplomats, in our international development professionals who have worked over the years in countries like Africa and the developing world. Are we utilizing that, that knowledge and expertise right now in the, in the decisions that the Canadian government is making to, to move ahead? What about the other, other organizations, the civil society organizations, Mining Watch, NSI, the tremendous wealth of knowledge NSI has uh, in the extractives industry, I don't have to say that, but the research that goes all the way back to the 1990s uh, in the extractives industry in, the, in Canada is not alone. Are we leveraging that, that knowledge, the wealth of knowledge, when organizations are now creating positions, jobs, uh, in, in this area of, of, of knowledge management, we are, we are throwing away a lot of this knowledge and experience that Canada has. How do we leverage that? So how do we leverage the good practices of the North that are, that are there right now? Uh, and, and how do we join up with countries like Australia who, are, uh, uh, who have a, a different mandate, a different way of, of, of doing their international development right now? Uh, so I'm going to leave you uh, at that because my time is over. So thank you very much for for the, your patient hearing.